by the Welcome Center on the way out. God bless and enjoy the teaching. All right, all right. good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. So great to see you guys. Excited to get in the Word with you as always. And today, Daniel chapter 6. So let's open our Bibles to Daniel chapter 6. And as you guys are finding your way there, I'm going to read a little bit of it for you before we pray. It says in verse 1, it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom. And over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give an account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above all the governors and the satraps because of an excellent spirit that was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the entire realm. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could not find charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, well, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators, the satraps, the counselors, the advisors, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man 30 days except you shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since his early days. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for the example that we see in Daniel. So many examples, Lord, throughout Daniel's life of really what we want to be and need to be as followers of you. And we thank you, Lord, for recording this for us so we can see not only that it's possible, but Lord, how we're supposed to do it under the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that even as we see this boldness now, that's revealed in Daniel here in chapter six, that you would make us men and women of boldness, Lord, by the power of the Spirit, that we might be a witness to this world around us the way that Daniel was a witness in his day. Lord, especially should we face persecution in the days in which we live. So Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit. We pray you would be the teacher, and we look forward to what you're going to show us today in your word and by your Spirit in our heart. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, today we look at a lion among men. This is one of the most famous chapters in all the Bible. And again, we're not going to get to the end where Daniel actually gets thrown into the lion's den, but we're going to see that really it's broken up in two different segments of boldness that Daniel needs. No doubt there had to be supernatural boldness to go into the lion's den with the confidence that your God was going to be your protector, which we will see next week Daniel did. But this week, we're going to see that Daniel also had a boldness facing against men and lions among men so that he would not have a fear of man and could stand for God. And this is something we need as well. You know, if we can't stand against men and get over the fear of man, we'll never be able to stand in the lion's den should God ever bring us to a greater uh, test of of our faith, such as something that great. And so Daniel here is gonna show us what it's like to be a lion among men. Now, what is the setting here again? Uh, Daniel has been a captive in Babylon, uh, had been a captive in Babylon, and now transferring over into the Medo-Persian Empire for about 70 years at this point. And when it was in his late 80s, so this is something where, again, you know, no doubt, I don't know what was going through Daniel's mind. I think Daniel realized that his life was one of turmoil and, and not maybe one that he would have a lot of rest in. But I think that by the time I got to my late 80s, I might be thinking, you know what? Probably by now it's going to be pretty smooth sailing from this point on. <laughs> Guess what? Daniel's about to go into the lion's den. It doesn't always get easier the older we get. As a matter of fact, sometimes the older we get, the harder it becomes, and yet God will give us the grace for every stage of life, every season of life, and every trial in life, and that's exactly what we're going to see that God did here for Daniel. And by the way, you think of all that Daniel went through. He survived being taken captive in Jerusalem by the Babylonian army as a teenager, so they came in and they were attacking. Daniel wasn't killed at that time. Then the threat of execution under Nebuchadnezzar if he couldn't interpret his dream, and God was faithful to him in that. 
And then dodging the event in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, so Daniel had seen God be faithful throughout his life. And again, with, with each episode that happened, all Daniel had to do was look back and remember. And by the way, I want to encourage each of you to do that. Whenever you face a new trial in your life, I think a lot of times we face the new trials and maybe you're in one right now. And what happens is it's all we can see. I'm in this trial. What am I going to do? Life's over or whatever, how our brain runs, you know. Think back. Have you ever had any other trials where you thought you were in big trouble and God pulled through and did something amazing? See, that's what you draw on. God, you were faithful then. You're going to be faithful now. Daniel can look back over his life and say, God, you were faithful then. You're going to be faithful now. You've been faithful through all of it. And so I'm going to trust you. And so, uh, and again, I think there's something else we need to realize. Again, as Daniel would, would be approaching or probably past what we would call retirement age in our day and age we live today, as far as a normal job, uh, again, for somebody following God, we never really retire. Uh, we serve God till the day we die, or at least we should. Now, I know in an earthly job, we typically have retirement times, and I get that. There's an age where you can retire and the social security and all that, or whatever the case might be. And, uh, and there's nothing wrong in that, especially if you have the nest egg set up and you're ready to go. And, but I think the danger for the Christian here, what Daniel realized that we need to realize, the danger for the Christian in today's environment is this. When we retire in our earthly job, it doesn't mean we're done serving the Lord. We never retire from the service of God. Now, again, uh, it's like I've shared with you guys. I'm going to try to, you know, until the Lord comes back or as long as I live, I want to try to continue to serve the Lord until the day I die. Now, I won't torture you if I get so old that it's miserable for all of us. Uh, if the Lord doesn't come back in time, I'm not going to torture you. Don't worry. I wouldn't do that. But I want to, there, there is no retirement date when it comes to serving God. There's retirement in the world, but not with God. So enjoy the fishing, enjoy the RV trip. But remember, your life is not RV trips and fishing just because you've retired. Your life is serving Jesus Christ until the day that God brings you in the kingdom of God, that you can stand before the Lord and hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. And so Daniel knew this. And we need to be aware of it. We need to uh, guard ourselves and understand that, that uh, you know, we're supposed to serve the Lord that way. But we also have to realize that even as we get older, there are no guarantees that we're not going to run into greater trials in life. And as I said, oftentimes we have the greater trials in life the longer we go along. But the good thing is we can see God's faithfulness through all of it, which gives us the strength for the next thing that we're facing. And now Daniel today is going to face, again, one of the largest trials he's faced. You think about where Nebuchadnezzar, his life was in danger there. His life's in danger here too. But the problem with this one, to me, it's even worse in that it's not just, okay, we're going to execute you if you can't interpret the dream, because typically that would be something very gracious. If I can use that word in execution, maybe your head cut off and it happened so quick you don't know anything. This was throwing someone to, in the lion's den, letting lions eat you while you're still alive. Now, don't meditate on that too long, all right? Tracy says, Mark, you paint pictures with your words. Be careful what you say. So I have to be careful not to go too long on that. My point is simply this. This was even much more fearful than being threatened of being put to death by Nebuchadnezzar. Thrown into a den of lions. And we'll talk more about that next week. I mean, the lions were very ferocious for a special reason in that day. But the bottom line is this would have been something that would have been very, very fearful in the earthly realm, in the natural realm. And this is why I call Daniel a lion among men. Because even when this threat comes, we're going to see that Daniel was very bold. And Daniel was very courageous. You know, it's interesting. When you look at Daniel, Daniel was from the tribe of Judah. It would appear. He was a descendant, it would appear, from David. And from David's line and the kingly line, it says the kings, uh, you know, they would take the king's sons and bring them back and do these uh, into the kingdom because it was the cream of the crop, so to speak, the nobles and the king's sons. And most believe he was from the line of David. He was in the line of Judah. And the insignia for Judah was the lion. That was their banner on their flag when they were coming through the wilderness. And, and as a family, that was their family banner. It was the lion which is very appropriate because, again, Jesus, being from the tribe of Judah, was known as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And so now we see that Daniel is actually in the line of his family line, had, had lions in it, if you will. Uh, the, the tradition of just the lion that represented them, but now also being in the same line of David and the lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus Christ, later on down the, the road. So it's appropriate that Daniel would have the boldness of a lion and the face of a lion because of what he was facing. But I want you guys to know this as well. You also are in the family line of a lion. And what do I mean by that? Your father is Jesus Christ. He is your Lord. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. You are his children, which means you are in the line of lions as well. 
And that's what God wants you to be. He wants you to rise up to be as bold as a lion. The Bible tells us to be that way, and especially in the days in which we live, we need that boldness. Now, let me encourage you. It's not a natural thing that happens. And the reason that's encouraging is because you're going to try to do it in your own strength, you'll fail. It is supernatural, which means you've got to go to God and say, God, come upon me with your Holy Spirit and give me boldness, and I can be as bold as a lion, and God will do that. You see, the hard thing that we face is, is that God says we are his sheep. And how does a sheep be like a lion? Well, imagine a sheep with a lion's head. That's what God wants us to be. You're supposed to, that's kind of a, a, a don't imagine it too long. But either way, um, we're to be bold as a lion, and yet we're sheep that follow the Lord. Now, we're not the sheep of the world. The sheep of the world follow the world. And that's where that whole term sheeple comes from, and don't be a sheeple, as they say. But look, we are God's sheep. We can't deny that. There's no running from the fact that we're God's sheep. But God said, for my sheep, not the world's sheep, but for my sheep, I'm calling you to be bold. I'm calling you to be strong and to realize that I am your shepherd and I'm the one that's gonna protect you. Again, I get this old picture of, you know what? We may be facing the enemy and we're this little sheep and we've got this face of a lion. How do we have that face of a lion? Because we look next to us and there stands our mighty shepherd with all power and authority. And the Bible says, simply stand and God will give you the victory. The enemy has to flee. And so that's what we have to be. We have to be as bold as a lion. Daniel was as bold as a lion, and it came through his years of walking with the Lord and the trials that he went through. Now, again, the year here is around 537 BC. It's two years after the fall of Babylon. He's now firmly involved in the new kingdom, the Medo-Persian Empire, and we're gonna see that they're gonna be setting up their kingdom here. By the way, this is also the second phase of Daniel's dream. If you remember Daniel chapter two, Daniel had the dream of the head of gold, that was Babylon. Now you have the chest and arms of silver, that's the Medo-Persian empire, both sides. And that's where we take up starting here in chapter six, verse one. And notice what it says as this new leader and the new leaders, as they were co-regents, were now taking over this new world kingdom. Chapter six, verse one. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the entire kingdom. Kingdom. Now, it's interesting to note here, Darius is a title and not a name. So we don't know exactly who Darius was. His name wasn't Darius. Uh, later on, there's going to be a Darius II. Um, he, it would be the same today as President or Caesar, okay? They all had individual names, but this was a title. So again, who was Darius? Some believe he may have been Ugbaru, who was, uh, went into battle with Cyrus when they took over Babylon. Uh, some think he might even have even been Cyrus. I reject that thought simply because when we get to the end of chapter 6, it'll say that Darius and Cyrus were there together ruling. So I don't believe it would be spoken that way of if they were the same person. So, But it doesn't really matter actually who Darius was other than he was the one sitting in this position at this time that was setting up the new government. And again, whenever you would take over, you would obviously have to set up a brand new government. Notice they had 120 satraps. That would be kind of like our Congress today, uh, where you had all your different leaders as you're setting up your Congress and your Senate, so to speak, over the entire kingdom. And over these, that is over the Congress and the Senate, we might say, if we want to get a modern day application, three governors of whom Daniel was the one. So it's almost like three vice presidents. You've got the king or the president in our picture for our government. Just give, they didn't have presidents in Congress and Senate. Don't confuse that. But in our picture for today's uh, uh, picture, that it would be like the president, three vice presidents, and then the Congress and Senate below that. So that kind of gives you the picture of what's going. So Daniel's right up there as a vice president, one of the three vice presidents, if you will, in his authority. And notice it says um, uh, that, he, that, that the satraps might give account to them so the king would suffer no loss. He was over, uh, over these were three, the three governors. And then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors, that is the other two, and the satraps, the 120, because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought to set him over the entire realm so basically, he's the single vice president, so to speak, or vice king because of what uh, Darius is going to do in putting him in this position. So God has elevated Daniel to this amazing spot. It's interesting to see that right before Babylon fell, God elevated Daniel to the third in the kingdom. It lasted for one night. And now we see that he's elevated again uh, to right to number two almost behind the main leader here as far as over everything because of his faithfulness to God. But you have to realize that we're talking politics here. 
Try to imagine this from a political standpoint. I know it's biblical, but we're talking politics. And what's happening here in politics is, is this guy, this Jew, who's not even a Mede or a Persian, has now been elevated to basically the second place in the kingdom behind the king, and he's over all the other Medes and Persians. Do you think that's going to cause a problem in political jealousy? You better believe it. Who is this guy? Why does he get to be there? We're the ones that came in to rule with him. The king has been going two years and Daniel gets put in place. This is wrong. And so we're going to see that because of this jealousy, they're driven to bring Daniel down and try to destroy him. Not only has he not been around that long, as far as they're concerned, in that particular kingdom, he's a foreigner. Who is this guy? Uh, and how did he get in this position? Well, we know that God's the one that put him there. But notice Darius noticed in him that he had a more excellent spirit. And isn't that true about those who have a life of walking with God? If you've been around those people that have spent their life truly walking with God, they have an excellent spirit. Now, it's the work of the Holy Spirit in their life, but it's an excellent spirit, and it's something to be emulated. It's like, wow, what is it about that person? And you've been around them. You're like, man, I just, there's something about them. That was Daniel. He was the kind of guy that entered the room, and it wasn't because he took command of the room and he had great charisma. I don't know exactly his personality, but it was simply the authority that God gave him. It was the presence that he loved the Lord. There was a humility to Daniel that made people feel comfortable. Have you ever been around uh, people that the world would think are important, but you feel very comfortable around them? I've had a chance to be around a couple of people over the years, two or three people that were important in the world's eyes. Some of them, you don't feel comfortable at all. You feel pretty much like you think you would feel very nervous and kind of you know, tight, if you will. And I've been around some where it's kind of like, wow, you're almost like, a family member or something. I mean, they look you in the eye and they talk to you like you're very important and special. And again, that's how people should respond. But we don't typically see that for those that are in higher positions. This was Daniel. That was the reputation that he had and everyone knew it. And so he had an excellent spirit within him. Um, it says that he excelled above the others. Uh, he distinguished himself. And it wasn't because he was trying to be greater than the others. It's just who Daniel was. When someone is made of that mold, they can't hide it. That's just who they are, and God will raise them up and use them in a greater way. And again, we're going to see before we're done with the study, it's because Daniel had a life of devotion to God. And we'll see what it was that Daniel did, and we'll be able to also emulate that as well uh, as we get toward the end here. But also, I think that it had to do with Daniel's reputation. How did Daniel rise to power so quickly? No doubt Daniel was famous in the world at this time. And you think, well, how could Daniel be famous in the world? Remember, Babylon ruled the world. And now the Medes and Persians ruled the known world of that time. No doubt word spread about some man in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom that told dreams and interpretations, and it came to pass exactly as he said, and he spoke to the gods, and the gods spoke back. You know, of course, they would have been thinking plural, multiple gods, and, 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 and all these stories would have been traveling about Daniel. No doubt Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they went into a fire, and they came out not even smelling like smoke. Who are these Jews? Who is their God? So Daniel had a reputation, absolutely. And that would have been something, look, the night that Belshazzar fell, Daniel gave the prophecy. You're going down tonight. They no doubt heard about that. Are you the man that predicted that we would conquer that night? Yes, indeed I am. I want you involved in the leadership of this kingdom because you hear from the gods and I need somebody around me that has that kind of connection to the supernatural. They recognize this in Daniel. And so that no doubt was another very important aspect of what was going on here with Daniel being placed in this position. Um, but again, it's interesting to the excellent spirit uh, distinguishing himself, but God is the one raising him up. And that's something to realize, guys. If we will seek the Lord and honor God and, and live our lives daily for the Lord, God is the one that raises up to what he wants you to do and what he wants you to be. And that's true in your workplace. That's true in the church. That's true everywhere. If you try to get there yourself and you fight and claw and pull like all these satraps are going to do, trying to pull Daniel down, it always ends in disaster, as we're going to see it does for them. But if you simply seek God and say, God, whatever you've created me to do, I want to do that and use me for your glory in that, whether it be in whatever purpose it might be. You know, it's interesting. I remember hearing one believer that was a very famous runner. And he said, you know what, Lord, I, I, I feel your pleasure when I run. And, I, and, and this kind of thing, I think a great prayer to be is, Lord, what have you gifted me to do? And now as I do that, Lord, feel your, let me feel your pleasure as I run. Whatever it is I'm doing for you, let me, let me feel your pleasure. Use me for what I'm called to do. And God has given you the gifts 
he wants you to use, and he's going to use you if you'll establish that life of consistency with him like Daniel did, and the rewards are great. Now, the persecution can also be great, as we're seeing here, but the rewards are great. So what happens when you have jealousy in politics? Well, we got to find some dirt on this guy, and we come to verse 4. Look what it says. So the governors and the satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. Hey, find some dirty laundry. Look, look at this guy's background. See if there's anything he's ever done. Look at his internet history. Let's find out what he's been Googling. Try to do something we can expose or whatever the case might be, right? And so, but Daniel was the type that if they were to check his Google history, it'd probably be something to do with a Bible study, right? So they couldn't find anything on Daniel and these kind of things, but they're looking for anything. Now, you would think a man of this quality, they would be glad to have around. They'd be glad to have him as a leader. That's not how the world operates, and especially in politics. It's cutthroat. Get rid of this guy. And it's interesting, you know, I was thinking the other day, a politic is basically something that latches on and sucks all your blood out, right? That's a politic. But anyway, these guys get involved... <laughs> These guys get involved in politics, right? And it's, it's a nasty scene. It's not something you want to be involved in. Daniel didn't choose politics. Daniel was just in the midst of politics, and God used him there. It's, by the way, we've talked about it before. If God calls you into politics, God can use you in that. But the thing to notice about Daniel is he didn't become like the rest of the politicians. He kept himself separate. He kept himself distinguished. And yes, he took great heat for it. But at the same time, we see that God honored him and God was faithful to him in the midst of it. And so here they say, what can we find? But notice this, but they could not find any charge or fault. What a testimony. Why? Because he was faithful. Nor was there any error or fault found in him. Again, I love the fact that as they examined his life with a fine tooth comb, they could find nothing to accuse Daniel of. Guys, wouldn't it be great if we all had that testimony before God? That every one of us, if they were to dig deep as they could in every area, look at all of our internet searching history. Look, I keep bringing that one up, but either way, some way they could you know, look at our work history, look at our whatever the case might be, our, our taxes or whatever. And when they did, they found, you know what? This, this person did nothing wrong. And everyone messes up, but they did nothing wrong. I remember the world is shocked when you do the right thing. But you as Christians do the right thing. And that is a testimony to the world when they see that. They try to find fault, but they're not gonna be able to find fault if you live above reproach. And the Bible tells us we need to live lives that are above reproach, that nobody can accuse us. You know, I think of how easily we can fall into a trap. I, I, um, a, a couple of years back, I, was, I went to the bank. I did the same thing you guys would have done. So this is not some kind of super Christian story. You'd have done the same thing. But I, I asked, you know, how much money I was getting out. I can't remember. And the machine spit it out. And the machine, I started walking away, counting the money. The machine had given me like $500 too much. Well, I didn't think about it. It didn't pop in my mind. Yeah. You know, that never popped in my mind. I turned around. I said, look, I said, something's wrong with your machine here. It gave me too much. Give it back to them. You should have seen the look on her face. I think, first of all, they were shocked that their machine messed up. They're you know, wondering, has that happened to someone else? But number two, wow, you brought it back. Now, there shouldn't be a wow factor to that. That should be what everyone does, right? The world doesn't do that. See, you do that. You did the same thing. You're Christians. You do that. That's your testimony. But something hit me really last service as I was sharing that that never hit me until last service that could have been so easy. Can you imagine if somehow they were looking for the, hey, we're short $500. Find out whose transaction that was. Oh, we found him. It's some guy named Mark Kirk. Let's see if we look him up. Oh, he's the pastor of Calvary Chapel. <laughs> now, I didn't turn it back in because of that. But my point is simply this. That not only would have ruined my testimony, what, what would that have done to, to this church? Pastor of Calvary Chapel, Knoxville, you know, runs off with 500 extra dollars from the bank when a machine messes up. Billy Graham said, God, don't let 30 minutes ruin 40 years of ministry. Guys, we have to be so on our guard. Everything has to be done right. It's not about being legalistic. That, that's not what matters. It's about recognizing that people are watching you. I tell you, listen, the more the ministry grows and the fact that we're on the radio, and I've been on the radio for like 15 years, people in Knoxville, a lot of them, at least in the Christian community, they may not listen to me, they may not like my teaching, but a lot of people know my voice. They've gone by the station. They've heard it on there or whatever. And I can't tell you, several times, I've been places, and somebody goes, it happened yesterday. Somebody goes, they looked at me. I know you. I know you. I don't know why I know you. I don't know. I said, Calvary Chapel. Okay, thank you. Because they either know the voice or they know the face or they whatever the case might be. And that means that, that, again, the accountability level should be higher for a pastor. But what I've realized and what God is showing me is, is everybody's watching. People are watching, Mark. But the thing that really hit me beyond that was, is, you know what, God, that shouldn't concern me because you're always watching. And even if I think, well, nobody saw that, God goes, I did. What are we going to do about it, Mark? Ah, please forgive me. 
and then God deals with it. We need to have that awareness. We need to be very God aware that we're being watched by the angels, by the Lord. They see everything we do. We need to be very, very aware that as Christians in community, we have a certain reputation. We're representing Jesus. And if we take the name of Christian, you know, it's interesting that we talk about, the Bible says, don't take the name of the Lord in vain. There's a lot of different meanings to that that go beyond the basic thing. When you take someone's name, you're taking them. It's like when someone gets married. What does the wife do? She takes the name of her husband. They're not one. She's taken his name. And that name now is represented by them as a couple. There's a representation. When we marry Jesus, the bride of Christ, when we say yes to him, guess what? We just took his name. We took his name. And so what he says is, don't take my name in vain. It's more than just using God's name in an inappropriate way. And I think there is an application to that, but it's much deeper. It's like, Mark, you have my name on you. You're representing me. You are my bride. You're my family. How are you conducting yourself among the world? Wow. Boy, do I need to pray. Boy, do I need the spirit of God working in my life. Boy, do I need more to be more aware because one day I'm gonna stand before God and we're gonna talk about all this. Now, again, I'm glad I'm not gonna be judged for my sin, but I wanna be able to stand before him and say, yeah, you know that I'm a sinner, Lord. You know that I'm only dust, and I remind him of that on a regular basis. I'm only dust because David did, so if David can do it, I can Things happen. Lord, remember, I'm just a dust speck. How much can you expect? You know? But I want to grow, and I know you want to grow. And being aware of who we are is going to have a big factor in that. Daniel was very, very aware. And even in his political setting here, he realized, I need to be found faultless. And I think for Daniel, a lot of it was just because of who Daniel was. Again, nobody expected Daniel to be perfect. God didn't expect Daniel to be perfect. He was still a, a man in these sinful bodies. But the re reality is, we're to be above reproach. We're to be faultless, at least as, as what we have power to do, as what we have control to do. We're to be faultless um, so that we're unaccusable. And this is what Daniel was. He was faultless. And so notice here, they said, you know, we can't find any fault in him. Look at verse five. Then these men said, we shall find we shall not rather find any charge against this Daniel. They keep calling him this Daniel. He should have kind of this, almost like this disdain when they talk about him. Unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Wow, what a testimony. Wouldn't it be great if somebody could say, no one can find anything against you except to accuse you that you believe the Bible. Guilty as charged. I'm, I'm guilty. If you say I believe the Bible, guilty as charged. I've always thought, and I, I've never been called for jury duty. I don't know why. I don't know that they avoid pastors. You know, watch me get called this week. <laughs> I don't want to be called for jury duty. But honestly, what I'm going to tell them is, I want you to know I believe the Bible literally, and that's how I'll be judging this. I probably will send me home. And I'll be like, okay, that's great. See you later. Time to go to lunch. Because I will, I will respect the laws of the land, but not where they contradict God's law. There's a higher law. It's God's law. And if you want me to sit on that jury, I'm going to be representing the God of heaven and his word. I'll be happy to sit there, but you need to know what you're getting before you sign me up. And so if you ever want to use that to get out of jury duty, <laughs> those are bonus points. That's just bonus points, guys. That's the Calvary Plus. If you're involved in Calvary Plus, I'm kidding. There's no Calvary Plus. <laughs> Everything has a plus behind it, doesn't it? You know, you got to add a plus and a little bit more or whatever. But, but, but what a testimony that nobody can find anything against you other than the worship of your God. Daniel was so faithful that they knew they couldn't find anything, but they said, if we can look what he does, and note this, if we can find what he's doing for his God and make that illegal, we can get him. Guys, that's what's happening today. Here's what I want you to note. Christians, with your eyes wide open, Satan does the same thing over and over and over. He's done it throughout history. And that is... If he can't get the church in trouble with the world, he'll change the laws so that if the church continues to honor God, now they're in trouble. And guys, note this. Back in the days of Rome, the Christians were doing nothing but believing the word of God. They were teaching the word of God and they were saying, look, if you're living this way and this lifestyle, you can't go to heaven. And so they labeled them haters. And Christians were known in that day as haters of men because they didn't go along with the culture. Does anybody see something coming back around? When this whole hate crime stuff first started, look, none of us could be against that. Certainly, who wants a hate crime? Hate crimes, are, nobody. What, a lot of crimes have hate connected, right? So there's a big swath that goes with that. But I saw something different. Knowing church history and knowing the wiles of the enemy, the moment it happened some 20 or 25 years ago, I started letting people know, this is gonna be used down the road against the church. 
it's going to corner believers that if we teach the word of God, what they're going to say is, you know what? These are now normal things, and we're going to pass laws to protect these people that are doing this way. And if you say anything from the pulpit or anywhere else against that, then you're going to be breaking law. You're going to be a hater. You're a hater. Now you're going to be in trouble. Look, we saw recently they went as far as for these moms. You got to love these moms. They showed up at these, uh, uh, these board meetings, whatever, stand up for their kids, and you know, all fiery say, you're not going to teach our kids that. And they start saying they were domestic terrorists. See, if you can change the language and take someone who's innocent, but change the language to make them guilty, that person stays the same, but the laws around them change. Guys, I believe that's coming to a world near you. Satan has done it in the past. I think he's going to do it again. I wouldn't be surprised if before long, certain things that I might teach from the pulpit might be against the law and might even be classified as a hate crime because I said that something was wrong. And again, in reality, it's actually a, a, a love crime. If there's any, the word crime doesn't really fit. It's the greatest measure of love you could do. Why? Because if somebody didn't come to me and say, Mark, you're living in sin. You need to repent. I never would have known. I wouldn't have repented. But someone was faithful to share that with me. And now I have eternity and I'm forgiven. Thank you for telling me I'm a sinner. Praise God that you had the boldness to do that. Because now I know how to be saved. How sad it is when somebody says, no, you can't tell them that. No, you can't try to bring them back away from that. You can't lead them to God. And so when I see this happening to Daniel, I'm like, here, again, I see it happening here. And then I watch what's happening, even with some of the bills that they've tried to pass over the last few years in Congress that would have made certain things in the Bible illegal to teach. That's happened. Maybe you're not aware of it. As a pastor, I'm very aware. I know when these bills come up because I recognize what's happening and I'm very aware of it. And it's going to be one of those things where one day it may actually pass. What then? And Daniel's going to be facing that. It's going to be a what then moment. If we don't pray for boldness now and decide where we're going to stand now and continue to do what we've done our whole life as Daniel's custom was, we're going to fail then. This is the moment, guys, to be bold, not when the trial comes. We need to be bold before the bill passes. We need to be bold before the language changes. And suddenly you, simply because you believe the Bible, get lumped in with something that's illegal or puts a label on you that is not true. And it's happening. Satan's very clever. He's, if he can't get us one way... He'll get us another. Uh, his tactics, as we said, they don't change. And so Daniel now is facing this, and they realize, all right, if we can't catch Daniel in anything that he's doing against the current laws, we will make new laws to trap him. And look what happens here in verse 6. So these governors and satraps throng before the king. So they came in this huge multitude, and they said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators, the satraps, the counselors, and the advisors have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree. Notice how firm they are in this bill they're writing in Congress. A firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days, except you, a little bit of flattery thrown in here, right, to lure him in, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, several things to note here. Um, you talk about lion, they're lion. Because they said at the very beginning, all of the governors and satraps. No, Daniel didn't. Daniel wasn't even there. Daniel was over all of them. He was the vice king, if you want to put it in modern day language. And they're saying, everybody's in agreement. No, just one of the most powerful men in the kingdom is in disagreement. And they're tricking the king who loved Daniel. He saw Daniel's distinguishedness. He saw Daniel's excellent spirit. He's being tricked here by flattery. Oh, king, no one can pray to anyone but you because you're so great. And the king's probably thinking, well, you know, I, can. I guess that does create loyalty. And so I'll go along with it. I don't think he was excessively prideful because of his heart toward Daniel. We'll see later in the chapter. But he allowed the flattery to get through. He didn't read between the lines. And now he's got a big problem here. And, and notice how, how radical this is. Again, he should have noticed. Again, now the difference, if, here comes the difference in Babylon and Medes and Persians, okay? The laws of Babylon can be changed immediately. If you passed a law in Babylon, the king, could, he could make a law and then change it the next moment. Not so with the Medes and Persians. They had kind of a Congress, Senate, that kind of thing we have. It wasn't a Congress and Senate. Don't be confused there, but a setup of leaders that way. If you passed a law, if the bill passed, you had to go back to the Congress to pass another bill to change it. And so they knew if they did this, they had Daniel trapped. So notice their language. Make a firm decree that cannot be changed. And they had it down in writing. And notice how radical they are, that they may be thrown in the lion's den? I mean, how about a heavy fine? Or maybe they, you know, they lose their whatever, their position. or what. But why are you so radical you want to take a human being and throw him to animals that eat him alive? Now you see the hatred they had toward Daniel and the God of Daniel. And again, that same spirit is around today. 
There's radical forces that are radically against Jesus Christ and radically against believers, and it's led by the demonic realm. That's what's going on here. It's not just pass a law so we can't do it. It's pass a law so we can watch him suffer and be tortured. And, uh, and again, all these horrible things happen here, again, if Daniel does this. So again, the king here, again, they foolishly, notice verse 9, the king dares he signed the written decree. He didn't think about it. He didn't think it through until suddenly they're going to come to him at the end of this day and say, guess what, O king? You're the number two guy. He's disobeying your law. And he's going to realize at that moment, I've been had. And we'll get to that next week. But look at this, between verse 9 and verse 10, guys, this is where it's decision time. Daniel heard about this. Look at the first few lines of verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew, I have that underlined, when Daniel knew, okay, Daniel heard this, and now is the moment of truth. What are we going to do when Christians become haters by law simply because we believe the Bible? What are you going to do, Christian? What's going to happen if that happens? Look. I'm not trying to bring fear in your heart. As a matter of fact, I learned something very interesting recently, the physiology, uh, the physiology of the brain, the way it works, and I think it's, I see God in this so much, that fear and boldness are, are linked in the brain. Somehow they're linked. I don't know how they know this or whatever, but I was just, recently this was brought to my attention. They're linked, and, and what they tell us, uh, those who study these things, they say that if fear begins to take over, if you can somehow shift that over into the bold realm, which is right next to it, you'll become just as bold as you were fearful. Isn't that great? God's design, what that means is that's why in battle, you think all these men that go in battle aren't afraid, they're human. They may be tough, they may be well-trained, but they're human. Nobody wants to be shot up and, and blown up. Nobody, naturally, that's not something you desire, right? So you get afraid, and what happens is when they realize, I have to fight, the, the fight is on. That first step to break out of that fear and start fighting is when it shifts over, they say, into the bold side, and suddenly you see these warriors running into battle, just, you know, all the army movies or whatever the case might be, and again, little, the little boy coming out there, but you know what I'm saying? But the bottom line is, it's true for men and women. So when you're feeling that fear, if you can just say, you know what, I'm not gonna be afraid of this, here we go, I'm stepping into it, I'm gonna do it, it'll shift over into boldness and you'll become very bold. This is where Daniel is. It's one thing to think, all right, I may lose my position. I may even be put to death. No, this is wild animals are gonna eat me while I'm alive. Again, I don't wanna paint too much of a picture, but that's what Daniel's facing between verse nine and verse 10. What's Daniel gonna do? What are we gonna do when these types of things, if they do come down the road for us sometime, what are we gonna do? And that's why we have to decide right now. And we're gonna see in a moment, the reason Daniel was able to make the decision between verse nine and verse 10 to do what he did is because he already had an established life with God on a daily basis for years and years and years, and he was ready. Do you have that? Because if you don't have that, when the trial comes, you're not gonna be ready. You see, it's not that some Christians can be super Christians and others can't. It's that some simply follow the guidelines of what the Lord has told us to do. And because of that, when the trial comes by the power of the Spirit, we can stand. It's God doing it, but it's God's plan that enables us to do it. So make sure that you're following God's plan. Again, we'll talk about more of that in just a moment as we wrap it up. But notice what Daniel does. When Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. Now, it would have been easy to kind of lay low for 30 days, wouldn't it? And that's what he does. And in his upper room, with the windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day. No doubt he knew they were watching him. He knew they were spying. They already knew he was going to do this. That's why they made up this bogus law. And he prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since his early days. Note this. He did the same thing he'd done his entire life, and we need to do the same thing we've done our entire life if we have a life established with the Lord. If we don't have a life established with the Lord, then we need to change it. And notice, as his custom was, that means that Daniel had a regular practice of going before the Lord, seeking God, and, being, and, just, and getting wisdom from God in his life. Guys, I want to encourage you, if you don't have that, it's time to start. You're going to need it more than ever, because whether you like it or not, you say, well, I just won't jump into the battle. The battle's coming to you. And you can sit back and wait while you hear the front lines and everybody's over there fighting. You can do that and say, I'm going to stay back here or whatever. The battle's going to get to you. And when the battle gets to you, you better be ready to go. And the way you do that is, is establishing a regular life with God. Daniel's custom. And again, there's several things here that Daniel did. It's interesting here. Notice he, he did this three times a day. First thing was he would pray. Um, and he did this three times a day. Why was Daniel praying three times a day? Well, probably because 
Uh, they had the morning and evening sacrifice they would do when Daniel was growing up there in Jerusalem. He probably established a regular habit of prayer in the morning. The priest would offer a morning lamb and the priest would offer an evening lamb. And it would appear that Daniel kind of got in this pattern of praying in the morning and praying in the evening. And knowing Daniel and his heart for God, he said, well, that's not enough for me. I'm going to pray in the middle of the day too, right? Kind of a God sandwich. You got on both sides, the bread on both sides and the meat in the middle. We're going to do this thing. And so Daniel was a man of prayer throughout the day. And again, I think maybe even Daniel got this from his father further down the line ahead of him, that is David, because he was in the line of Judah, where David wrote in Psalm 55, 17, he said, evening and morning and at noon, I will pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. So David followed this tradition as well. Now, I'm not saying that means we have to do that. That's not a bad thing to do. I think that praying throughout the day is a great thing to do. We should pray throughout the day. But uh, again, this is something they felt convicted to do uh, in, in the way that God led them. But again, this is why I said, notice what he does. He throws open the windows and he begins to pray like it was any other day. This is why he called Daniel a lion among men. Because he realized they're watching me. Now, no, notice what he did. Daniel didn't run out into the streets to make a scene. Okay. Oh, Lord God of heaven, they've now outlawed your word. And I'm going to stand right here and say that these things are wrong. And those people are sinners. And I'm going to do that. He didn't go out and draw attention to himself. He wasn't obnoxious. He just did what he'd always done. I'm going to seek God. I'm going to pray. I'm going to be in the word. I'm going to be in fellowship. Today we say go to church. I'm going to do everything I've always done and keep seeking God regardless of how the laws around me change. I'm going to keep teaching and believing the same thing I've always taught regardless of how the laws around me change and whatever happens because God doesn't change. Man does, but God doesn't. Daniel did that. And yet, because Daniel was doing that, they knew that he, they, that he, was being, he, knew he was being watched. And this shows the boldness that he had because in essence, this is the decision that was made for the lion's den right here. It wasn't in the lion's den, that's when it hit him. No, right now is the decision. I will be thrown in the lion's den if I do this, but God, I will not deny you. I will not allow the laws of the land to cause me to deny my God. I will not fear man over fearing you. This is what Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28. And do not fear those who kill the body, but they cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. In other words, the only thing that the world can do to us down here is temporary it's, it, it, may, it may not be fun, but it's temporary. We, our dealings with God are eternal. Do you see the difference in magnitude here? Temporary, eternal. We need to make the right decision. And by the way, I want to, I want to encourage you guys about being bold for the Lord. Should you ever face some situation where you have some major persecution because you make a stand for God? If you go and read the Fox's Book of Martyrs, I've shared this with you before, and other testimonies of those who watched Christians being persecuted, they were astounded at their peace and their boldness. They were actually singing while they were putting them to death in many instances. Guys, that's supernatural. What is my point? Should you ever face that, I believe God's going to come in with a supernatural power and joy that you're not going to know until you need it. And I don't think it's going to be a thing of, oh, I think it's going to be a thing of, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Here we go. And you're just going to step into the kingdom singing and giving praise to God. God will give you what you need, and history has proven it, and the, the witnesses to the martyrs have proven it as well. Take courage, you little sheep with lion's heads. Take courage. Your God will give you boldness. He will be your strength. He will help you. He will not give you more than you can handle. God is faithful. And again, uh, we see Daniel, or rather Peter, you know, when they were confronting him about don't preach in the name of Jesus anymore. He said, whether it's right to obey God or you, look at verse Acts uh, 5, 29. He said, we, we ought to obey God rather than men. He said, you, you decide. You guys decide what's right or wrong, but we're going to obey God. We're not going to obey men. That boldness came from God and by the Spirit of God. And by the way, just before this, Peter had been afraid. Remember, he denied the Lord three times. And then all of a sudden, when the Spirit was poured out, Peter stands up before all those people that put the Lord to death and said, you're all sinners and you need to repent. Where did that come from? I don't think it was a motivational class he got at his church or some preacher that encouraged him that day. It was supernatural. That's why we have to pray, God, come upon us with your Spirit. Give us supernatural power. Give us supernatural boldness. We will be your witnesses if you do that. So we leave it on him and God will be faithful to do that. And by the way, when you see all this uh, boldness and, and trials or whatever you think, and especially when he's dealing with the government here, uh, notice this, this brings up a question. What about government authorities? What happens when the government passes a law or says that we have to do something that goes against God's word or our conscience? Guys, notice there's two things you can't violate. God's word and your conscience. 
And if those things are violated, you need, to, you need to simply say no and trust God with the outcome of whatever's going to happen. That's exactly what Peter was doing. That's what Daniel's doing. That's what we need to be doing as well. So what do we do when the Bible says in Romans 13, come under the governing authorities? Yes, unless they go against the word of God and against our conscience. And then the Bible says there's a higher authority and that's God Almighty. And so we stand firm and we trust God with the consequences and the outcome. Daniel is now doing that very thing. And again, I wanna again point out some things. It wouldn't be fair before we finish today to tell you to be bold in the Lord and not give you some ammunition on how to do that. And the first thing we see here when it comes to Daniel being bold, I want you to note this, is Daniel had an established daily life with God. If you do not have an established daily life with God, step one's already gone. You don't even have step one. Listen, start a daily established life with God. Mark, what does that mean? It means simply get in the Bible, read some Bible, every day read some of the Bible, however you want to do it. Start at the beginning through a book, whatever you want to do. What are these through the year like the, the ladies are doing? You know, bouncing, however you want to do it. Be in the word of God and then pray. And I'll tell you, when it comes to praying, um, praying is something you have to develop over time. Praying is not always easy. And a lot of people may not want to admit that, but prayer can be very hard. I mean, to make yourself pray, everything seems to interfere with that. You gotta remember, there's a spiritual battle going on when you're trying to pray. But if you will say, I'm not gonna let anything interrupt this, I'm gonna read this portion of scripture, I'm gonna pray, and if you get in a regular habit of that day after day after day after day, eventually it becomes such a part of your life you can't imagine not having it. And guys, I'll tell you, some of the sweetest moments I have, I look forward to getting alone to be with God. It's exciting. It's where I get to pour out my heart. It's where I get to share my heart with God, hear him share his heart with me. It's where God speaks to me. Again, he does it beyond that, but there needs to be that relationship. And I also want to encourage you, you don't have to be a Superman hero to do that either, especially if you're first starting. Just read a chapter and pray for five minutes. Start there. Just if you try to read for 30 minutes or whatever and read a whole book of the Bible and what, you're gonna get to where, look, you just start that, it may be too hard. And if you can do that, praise the Lord. But start out gentle, let God grow it. One chapter will turn to two, two chapters will turn to three. Five minutes will turn to 10, 10 minutes will turn to 15. Let God grow it as he wants to grow it. And don't feel a pressure, it's not a works thing. You're not earning anything, you're his child. He loves you already. Whether you're in the Bible and prayer or not, he loves you but he sees your weakness if you're not getting the power you need in the word of God and prayer. So Daniel had a custom in his life to do this. We need to develop and make it a custom in our life and follow through. So that's the first thing. Secondly, notice here, it says that when Daniel threw the windows open and prayed toward Jerusalem, he gave thanks to the God of heaven. We need to be thankful. We need to be thankful, even in the midst of trials. Look, if anybody could say this is not a moment to be thankful, it could be Daniel. God, how could you let this happen? I've served you all these years. They're gonna throw me to lions. No, Daniel no doubt was saying, God, I thank you so much. I've had the privilege to serve you. And even if they throw me to the lions, I thank you that I'm gonna be in the kingdom with you and that you're my God. I don't know what Daniel was saying, but Daniel was thanking, it says. He was thankful. Now note this. The Bible doesn't say to be thankful for those things that happened in our life. It says to be thankful in them. So I'm not thankful that I broke my leg and wrecked my car, okay? But I'm thankful that I, did, that I didn't break both legs and die. God, thank you that you spared my life. Thank you, Lord, that you, you know, whatever. You can, there's so many things to be thankful for, so be thankful in these things. Not, not necessarily have to be thankful for them, but thankful in them. Daniel was thankful in God's faithfulness. He was thankful for what God had done, and he was giving thanks to the Lord. That's the second thing, having the established life with God. Number two, being thankful even in the midst of trials. And the last thing, notice he threw his windows open to Jerusalem, toward Jerusalem to pray. This goes back to Solomon. When Solomon dedicated the temple, he said, God, if any of our people are outside of Israel and they turn and face toward the temple in Jerusalem, hear their prayer in heaven. It was symbolic to them, not that God was in Jerusalem only, but it was symbolic that you're the God we serve, and in essence, we're turning our eyes to you. Here's the third thing. When we find ourselves in the midst of trials and hard times, we turn our eyes to the Lord and firmly fix them there. You know, we see Peter, remember the classic, he got his eyes off the Lord, he began to sink when he was trying to walk on water because he got his eyes off the Lord. Now we see the same thing here. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Daniel gets his eyes fixed on the Lord. So he's in the word and prayer on a regular basis. He's thanking God for God's faithfulness. His eyes are firmly fixed on the Lord. And, and because of this, he's able to find the strength that he needs to walk with God. As listen, as we finish today, and I just wanna say this, I, 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 we need to become men and women of consistency with God, men and women of prayer with God, but we also need to be men and women 
who are bold for God. We need to be men among lions, or lions among men, rather. And it would work the other way, too. Or, and you need to be lionesses among women, you ladies. And that only comes from time with God and the power of the Holy Spirit. But that's what God desires, and that's what we need to be, especially in the days that we're living. So I want to finish today as we pray. I want to pray that, again, God would help us to be bold, that God would give us that boldness, and that God would give those of you that maybe don't have a daily established custom as it was of seeking God every day, that that would begin today, not by your own efforts. You're going to have to put effort in the sense of going to do it, but it's going to be God that has to give you the power, or you're never going to be able to follow through. And so I'm going to pray for both as we finish today. So let's pray. Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for, again, the example Daniel gave us and showing us, Lord, how Daniel was able to do it. It wasn't by his might or his power. It was you. But God, Daniel established a regular custom of seeking you daily, and he didn't, he didn't vary from it. Even when the trials came, even when the laws changed, even when life got difficult, Lord, Daniel stayed faithful. He followed through with staying consistent in his relationship to you. Lord, Daniel was thankful. He thanked you for all the things you'd done and didn't focus on the things that had gone wrong. Give us a heart like that as well. And Lord, Daniel kept his eyes fixed on you, even though everything around him looked like it was falling apart. Lord, give us the fortitude and the ability to do that. I pray you would do that, God, that you would make us lions among men, lionesses among women, simply following you, the lion of the tribe of Judah, and realizing, God, that it's not by our power or our might. We simply stand next to you, and you're the one that gives the victory, for you are our shepherd. And so, Father, we thank you, God. Fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your boldness. And, Lord, let your work accomplish what you sent it to do today. And again, God, have mercy on our nation. I pray that we never face these types of things. But, Lord, we know the wiles of the enemy. Now that we know, let us be prepared should we ever face such a situation. And let us prepare today. God, I thank you for the work of your spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name.